Right, we're delighted to be joined now on the line by Clare TD, Carl Crow of Fianna Fáil. Carl, thanks very much for joining us on the Clare Echo. Thanks, Carl. Um, strange surroundings. <laughs> strange surroundings is right. Um, Carl, to begin, general election 2020 was on the second weekend of February. It almost seems like uh, an eternity ago. Have you been like the TD? Yeah, it's been the strangest start to a new job. I suppose when you begin any new job, you want to immediately delve into it, immerse yourself in, the, in all the workings. Uh, but there's been very few dull sittings since I've been elected. Uh, but yet the work has never been busier. So at the moment, I'm here, here in my home office, um, here here in the house. The, my wife has gone out uh, to the garden there with the kids to keep them nice and quiet. And this is how the last number of weeks have been playing out. I suppose it's uh, going in here to the home office and tearing into emails, phone calls, uh, dealing with uh, representational issues, and then uh, half an hour later going out and kicking balls. So certainly there are very nice aspects to it, uh, but I, I really did want to be in the door more often. But look, that just isn't possible. A lot of people, uh, myself included, have had to change their working lives, and that's just a reality for we're at at the moment. And Carl, with the current pandemic, like three young children all under the age of five, how are you coping down in South Clare? Well, we've one who's past the age of five just yesterday. We had a little birthday yesterday. It's all good. Uh, yeah, look, the most important thing from everyone's point of view at the moment is that I suppose we're healthy and other houses are healthy. That, that's look, It's about health at the moment, isn't it? So I think once people are healthy and happy, that's the main thing. Uh, but yes, the days are a little bit longer than you'd expect. We're up at daybreak. Um, there's bright mornings now and trying to tell kids that it's uh, you still need to sleep another while. That doesn't work too well. So, look, it's good. We're trying to keep routines going. Um, and as I said, the, the, the emails, phone calls have never been busier. A lot of very real issues coming at the moment. Um, people who have been in the steadiest of employment uh, just three or four weeks ago now find themselves uh, embroiled with social welfare claims, um, medical care claims, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, has really gone into overdrive and uh, I'm spending a lot of time assisting people with those kind of queries so it's uh, it's interesting but um, it, it, people you know people who never probably faced difficulties in their life from a financial point of view uh, suddenly are facing um, real struggles at the moment and that's probably where most of the volume of work is at the moment. Yeah. And Carl I can imagine there hasn't been too many meetings of the Fianna Fáil parliamentary uh, party seen since the, the election took place but at one of them you would have called on Michal Martin to form a, a national government rather than enter coalition with Fine Gael. It hasn't panned out the way you would have liked I, I'm only assuming. So we've had uh, we've had two face-to-face -face parliamentary party meetings and we've had two further ones via teleconference and they were interesting meetings. The teleconference ones were very interesting because there was 30 something voices on a phone and uh, you would know some of the voices. It was like, uh, in some ways, it was like uh, this, listening to Callan's kicks on the radio. Some of the voices are very distinctive. You would know instantly who you're talking to and others less so. So, I, look, I, I do my talking uh, in those meetings uh, and in the teleconference. Now, some of what I said um, was reported on the media. I, I don't really want to get into that too much, but I suppose all along I would uh, have explained my, my personal views of things to the leadership of the party. Uh, I've every faith that Michael Martin and the uh, negotiating team he's assembled around him have done a very good job of late. It's a very difficult task because I think what we saw a few weeks ago was everyone wanted to govern a few weeks ago. The economy was quite buoyant. We had all just come on the springboard of a general election. Mary Lou MacDonald was even holding rallies around the country. Uh, and suddenly I think there's uh, less of a willingness, I think, from some uh, parties and individuals to govern. But I hope that will be changing somewhat in the coming weeks. There's a document out there now um, that Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael have jointly put forward uh, and I think it's up to uh, members of the public and more importantly political parties to dissect and to see if uh, they can fit within uh, a governing configuration. But within that call I suppose there's a lot of unhappiness uh, especially locally and clear among Fianna Fáil members that are really against going into partnership with, with Fine Gael like so I guess as the new TD you're the one that's going to deal with the brunt of that within Clare if this was to happen and potentially it might be down the road that you'd pay the price for that. I suppose I, I'm not going to say that everything's hunky-dory because I suppose it isn't. Uh, look it's uh, it would be a seismic change in direction for Fianna Fáil to go into government with Fine Gael. I think that's been well commentated on in the in the in the media, uh, and indeed within our own membership, I'd say it's quite split in terms of how people see the party having to go forward. I think it's essential that members have a say in what transpires next. 
Uh, and just last weekend, I hosted a Zoom meeting for Fianna Fáil members. I had uh, one with councillors, first of all, for half an hour, and then with the wider party membership. So, yeah, that was, that was a very interesting, uh, two very interesting uh, meetings. Uh, it was a new departure for all of us. Uh, but certainly within the membership, there were a few different points of view, and I'll just maybe explain those a little bit. So there's definitely a block of people outrightly opposed to... Um, Fianna Fáil going into government and they would like to see a broader uh, coalition of parties right up to the point maybe of having national government. You have others who are very keen on uh, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael establishing government. They see that bringing huge stability at a time of crisis. And there's another uh, school of thought within the party membership that would very much like to see the situation evolve. I think right now it's important that um, we do allow things to evolve. There's a, a very positive framework document. It's 24 pages long. Uh, it deals with uh, quite a number of areas. It comes under 10 headings. Uh, it's a very positive document. Uh, I don't think there's many who could disagree with its sentiment. But the other parties now have asked for greater detail, and that's good. I think that that's what everyone wanted to see happen. Uh, and I see that in the last couple of days, Social Democrats have looked at uh, detailing in terms of costings, etc. That is important too. So I think this process has to evolve a little bit. We're not within days of having a government. We're probably within weeks of having a government. But as a Fianna Fáil TD, I would hope that our members would be uh, consulted um, as well along the way. It's very important that members would have a say in a process. Each party has their own mechanisms. Fianna Fáil has one member, one vote. Uh, Fine Gael has their own mechanism. And I think the Greens, I think two thirds of their party, for example, would have to agree. Something similar in Labour. So I think all those processes have to, have to happen and that will slow things as well. So you're hopeful members of EVA will have a say within Fianna Fáil, which in terms of confidence, how confident are you that they will have a say? So right now, I know, I know since I spoke with members last weekend, uh, members of the front bench of Fianna Fáil have been contacting uh, various elements of the organisation. So councillors, I think, initially will get phone calls. Um, there'll be uh, negotiations and chats with um, those who head up the party in terms of chairs and secretaries. So I think all of that is happening initially. Um, and I hope to have more Zoom meetings, um, which seems very strange. It's a distant way of communicating with people you know so well. But I think it's in these strange times we have to look at such mechanisms to talk uh, and, tr and trash all this out. Um, so I don't know. I mean, look, ordinarily speaking, you would have an Ardesh. Um, now, there's, I, I, there's, is it 20,000 or 30,000 Fianna Fáil members of the country? You would have to get them. They wouldn't all attend, of course, but you'd have to get a sizable portion of them, probably up to the RDS or City West or something like that in Dublin. They would cast their ballot and you'd have an outcome that evening. Uh, that certainly isn't possible. It isn't legal at the moment because of the COVID-19 restrictions. So there's other mechanisms, I think, have to be looked at to gauge uh, the views and opinions of party members. And I do know that... Um, that Michael Martin and indeed the staff in Fianna Fáil headquarters are looking at that. But um, that, that is certainly happening. Uh, but I think parallel to that, there's a very interesting process happening where other parties uh, are now starting to dissect that document. And I think that's, um, that's what the, the public are going to be most interested in. I, I think right now, in a time of crisis, with many um, you know, nurses, doctors in our county, and emergency staff, and even shop um, retail assistance, so many people are out there on the front line, keeping our country ticking over, um, putting their lives at risk. I think all of those people, I think they need and want and demand a government. And I think most people in the country, you know, I'm a Fianna Fáil loyal party hack. It, it, the configuration of government means an awful lot to me and a lot of the Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Labour, Green, Faithful. Uh, but ultimately, I think most people in our county who will be watching this and who read the Clare Echo, it, it's immaterial to them really who's Taoiseach and who's in cabinet they just want a stable government and I really hope that we can help that to happen uh, sooner rather than later and I'm not sure what configuration that will take yet. Carl so from the teleconference that you would have spoke for the national government rather than the coalition what is it that has changed because obviously that was held via teleconference because of the COVID-19 so what changed for you personally that are now I suppose buying into this as opposed to being against it? So I suppose first of all, there's um that was a I suppose a private contribution I made in the meeting um, but but look there's a process underway uh, and I'm very keen if I was never a TD I would really want to see that process evolve a little bit um, so far just two parties have had a chat about a document uh, it deals with everything from the rural agenda to health housing social welfare 
um, climate change. A lot of real positives in that. That document has been out. Um, in some areas, it gives detail, and other areas are vague, deliberately vague, because I think it invites uh, responses there from from other parties, and individuals. That document's out there. It's um, it's for public consumption. It's for other parties to peruse and uh, and trash out with their members. And I think it's important, if nothing else, if nothing else, that we have that process uh, conclude before uh, any party makes its final decisions. And as I said, each party has its own. Uh, convoluted mechanisms for making that decision but at the very least we need to allow that process. Nobody I think um, wants an election again. An election can't happen in the coming weeks anyway because of COVID-19 and restrictions. I don't think politically it would be good for the country. It would be very destabilising if we would have one. We do need a government. I think it would be insulting to frontline workers if everyone threw the towel in at this time and said we can't work with each other. I think a national crisis uh, de demands a national solution. Uh, and there's, there's a document out there now that um, I think offers governance. Um, there'll be pros and cons to that, uh, and I have my own views on that too. But at the very least, we should allow the dialogue to flow, uh, parties to give their feedback and see what comes out of that. And Carl, would you say with Hall Martin and this unforeseen coming together possibly of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, is it his desire to become Taoiseach? Is he putting himself before the party of Fianna Fáil? No, if anything at the moment, uh, and I know this from, from chats I've had with Michal Martin quite a few in the last number of days, that Michal Martin and indeed Fianna Fáil are putting the country uh, before anything else because, um, you know, there has been plenty of analysis of this in newspapers and on TV, um, probably politically and electorally, uh, going into a government with your largest rival or even talking about that process. Um, it, 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 it's somewhat politically damaging, and I think, I think most analysts can see that. Um, so Fianna Fáil have gone about that negotiation. They have spoken with people uh, that a few weeks ago, you know, wasn't an option. Uh, and I think that shows that uh, it's reflective of where the party uh, has seen itself in recent weeks. It sees itself having a role um, in terms of governance. It sees itself having a, a role in terms of... Uh, providing solutions at a time of national crisis. Um, it's a very fluid document. I think, you know, if we had this conversation a week ago or if we had a second conversation in a week's time, I think things could be changed totally, you know, there, there could be totally different outcomes this again. So I, I, I just think if nothing else, this process has to continue to evolve. Um, that 24-page document is detailed and vague, depending on which page you turn of it. But I think uh, members of the political parties will ultimately uh, have a really detailed document and I think that's the document the people of Ireland who are in no way politically affiliated the, the regular citizens of Ireland who, who who couldn't care less who's governing so long as it's a solid government I think that's the document they really want to see ultimately. As part of it as well Carl, the the concept of a ro rotating Taoiseach um, as someone like yourself you're, you're big into history what do you, do you make of it like um, it's obviously unheard of? Yeah, it, it can work. Um, I, th I think it has to work. There's going to be no, um, there's going to be no majority rule here anyway. This has to be a coalition government. It's either coalition government here or back to the country, um, because the configuration of seats, uh, it, it was. If we just go back slightly, it was the most unbelievable election outcome to see um, what what it was always two big parties in Ireland now joined by a third party, Sinn Féin, and there are only there's only a, you know, a seat or two between any of them. So th there's no way you're going to have. Uh, one party governance here it has to be coalition government and if you want uh, long-term stability and long-term government uh, you know any party could rightly claim that they have a right to have a Taoiseach within that configuration so it's going to it will be a rotating Taoiseach whatever form that takes I don't know but I, I think that can be a solid basis for it um, what you have in Dáil Éireann uh, you have many talented people um, who have leadership qualities so just we'll, we'll have a good Taoiseach uh, out of this process will have a good um, government but what configuration that takes I don't yet know and that will ultimately I think be decided uh, by other parties and ultimately by the members of the constituent parties that will that will make up government. As well Carl, um, you've had plenty of time to reflect and in the lead up to the general election of course you got national headlines for your stance on RIC commemorations. So I suppose with that time to reflect, 
in any way do you think inadvertently your stance, which led to a, a wide range in conversation, do you think that led to an increase in support for Sinn Féin on the ground, even though it wasn't your intention, obviously? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, no, it's I, I, I don't think it did me any harm electorally, firstly. I, look, Sinn Féin have to go out and uh, put out their own manifest on Violet Ann was there, Kansas in the county, and she polled very well. Uh, and, and I mean, disrespectfully, she polled higher than, than everyone expected. I think it was a surprising result, but it's a result we, we respect and acknowledge. Um, in terms of my stance in the RIC, it probably did me no harm electorally. It came up on doors, but I, I think anyone who knows me, I think a lot of people in the county now would have seen uh, and heard what I say about history over the years and months. Uh, this, was, this wasn't this was election opportunism. I firmly believed I would have resigned as mayor, in fact, uh, if it had come down to it on this issue alone. Um, so it wasn't done for, uh, people called it bandwagon. I certainly didn't jump on the bandwagon. I set off the bandwagon. So, I mean, you, you can't really, I started a movement that um, uh, I think was an important one to have. I've also been talking um, with figures in Fianna Fáil. I want to, first and foremost, um, when the doll is fully up and running, the economy is everything here now, and it has to be a sustainable economy, and there's climate change, and there's the well-being of our citizens, there's health, there's all of that. But when we've all of those programmes up and running, and when we're delivering as a country in those regards, uh, the commemorations will still continue. We're still in this decade of centenaries. I have a lot of thoughts on it. I'll be feeding into that. Um, I'd like to show some leadership in that. I don't expect they'll put me into cabinet in my first few weeks as a TD. So I'm, I'm not expecting uh, to be leading out a department in, in, in any regard like that. I'm, I'm quite realistic in those regards, but I would I would hope to um, have some inputs in terms of commemoration because I think it's important. Um, I have, I'm, I must show you actually, if, 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 if we can manage this, I'm going to show you something I have in my office because um, just, just one moment. The, an RIT whistle from Clare. So this was used by a sergeant in our county. So, um, you know, I'm I'm absolutely not against um, the RIC mm -hmm. items like that. This, this was gifted to me a few years ago. But items like that belong in a museum, and you know, school kids should be learning about them. The general public should be learning about items like that. They have a place in history. But commemorating is an act of celebration, and that that is why I took the stance day one. You can't celebrate an organisation that subverts it. Um, Ireland's will for independence, but you can certainly remember them. You can do other things to remember them. You can you can have educational programs, uh, you can have um, documentaries, etc. But th that's really what I want to see. But I've often spoken about whistle, and people said it didn't exist. It does exist. I have it here in the office, and uh, it's it's just a little trinket there I have over the top of my desk. Um, and, and look, history matters hugely to me, and I suppose I, I'm going to. I may as well tell the clear echo as opposed to him, but I'm going to when I'm in Dáil Éireann. Uh, you know those little five minute breaks you occasionally get and you're moving from the Dáil Chamber across the office. I'll be using uh, my camera phone occasionally to blog about some of the history of Leinster House because I've been blogging about clear history for a number of years. But I think if people want to follow my social media pages, they might get some behind the scenes uh, insights into Leinster House as well. So it's another passion I have in life, a uh, history. And um, I try to be true to myself at all times when I'm a TD. I can assure people I won't be losing the run of myself and uh, I'll be doing what I've always done here at county level. But just, just to follow up there on, on, on that, that question itself, but do you do you think when you have thought about it that it did, you know, that stance, that it did actually help Sinn Féin? I know by the time got in and it was a surprise, but do you think it just led to that conversation taking place that, that you know, that, that Sinn Féin happened to benefit from? No, I, I, I wouldn't agree. And actually, if, if it if it wasn't done for political gain uh, from myself personally or from my party, but if you do want to look at that metric, uh, the opinion poll that followed my stance on the RIC, uh, Fianna Fáil had a bounce in that opinion poll. Now, I can't take, you know, I can't take all the credit for that, but Fianna Fáil, uh, four days, four or five days later, had jumped up to 32% uh, in the opinion polls. And obviously that had uh, that had dropped off again by the time the actual polling day came around. So uh, politics can be quite fickle and something that happens on Monday evolves during the week and by Sunday, it can give you a boost in opinion poll or it can decline. Look, what people in Clare really want it uh, and nationally is I think they want to give a message to government, um, the outgoing government, and I think they did. Uh, I think that uh, throughout the country, um, Sinn Féin had a surge vote. I don't necessarily believe that will be replicated if we had another election, you know, next week, next month. 
I could be proven wrong, and if I am, I've no, I've, I, you know, I hold my my hands up in that regards. But um, I think if we did an election in Clare, even you know, a few months time, you're not guaranteed to get the same outcomes. Um, and I certainly didn't do anything to help uh, Sinn Féin's cause. Uh, and uh, anything that they as a party do, or Fine Gael or any other party, I think they own that for themselves. Um, I stood for Fianna Fáil, uh, and I've my own personal belief system that I've been unwavering in as well. Uh, so I, I think, um, are they giving me credit for an... Uh, <laughs> are they giving me credit for... An, <laughs> um, but Carl, just to touch on as well, you know, obviously you're not teaching at the minute, but... What, what are your thoughts there? I know you're a primary school teacher, but just the leaving certificate and just there's so much uncertainty regarding the school term. Like we'll say, we know you're not Minister for Education, but if you were, what would you do in this instance? Yeah, so I've had quite a few chats with people today on this. Um, if I'm honest with you, a week ago, I had a very hard line position and I felt that the leaving cert should happen, has to happen, happens every year. I, I don't ever remember a year where we didn't have leaving cert. I think third level uh, colleges demand a benchmark of attainment. You know, you need to reach a certain standard to get into third level. So there's all of that and there's all the preparation that's going in over a two year leaving cert cycle. It will be a waste to throw it away. But um, just today, I had a few calls and emails uh, and I had more over the weekend from students and teachers who say that if they end up with an August leaving cert, that effectively becomes a 12 month academic year. There's huge mental strain on uh, these youngsters trying to keep, you know, a peak performance academically to get to that exam point. Um, it's very hard to maintain it. And even there isn't any certainty it'll happen in late July or August. So the point is made to be as well by another Leaving Cert student that her parents, you know, have only budgeted a certain amount of money for getting her to college and her accommodation. She was going to be fully relying on working three months over the summer to, to build up a bit of a war chest of money to take her to her first year in college. That, that can't happen now either. So I suppose my, my, my position on it has changed a little bit. What, what I think is we are, as a country, in a state of lockdown. I know the teacher doesn't like calling it lockdown, but it is a lockdown of sorts, until the first week of May. I think the right decision for the Minister of Education would be when we get to that first week of May to evaluate you know, what, what's ahead of us at that point and may have to come down to cancelling leaving cert, looking at aggregating scores from the, the mock leaving cert and Christmas exams. But I think if, if the curve we keep talking about, if that's continuing to flatten, if we're getting down to low levels of contagion, I think then they need to set it in stone insofar as possible that we will have a leaving cert. The students out there really want certainty. I saw the poll conducted in St. Cayman School. It's the uncertainty that's killing them at the moment. So I think when we get to early May, I think the Minister needs to call it at that point um, for everyone's sake. And as well, Cahal, your ex-colleagues in Partee National School and all their counterparts in primary schools around the county and the country, they're finding it difficult as well. I can only imagine to be constantly, I know they have two weeks for Easter, but just to be up alone online, they're like yourself now that your phone or the email could be going the whole time. So it's, it's very difficult for a lot of people in, in a number of different industries. Yeah, it's very difficult. And I, I, I certainly know I'm, I'm, I'm in constant daily contact with uh, my old teacher, colleagues and friends. Does not one of them look for sympathy anyway? I think they look there. The, the job is totally different to what it was a few weeks ago, but they're putting up content uh, quite regularly so that students from home can check in. But um, look, I think in that regard, teachers are doing a good job. But let's, you know, let's be clear on this. They have it a hell of a lot easier than someone who's going out there, uh, going into one of our hospitals, putting down 12, a 12 hour shift there. So, uh, what's also been really interesting, and I, I saw Minister Simon Harris reflect on this the other night on, on Twitter, is that, um, you know, there are so many other people in our economy uh, that are now. The work they're doing is even more valued than ever. The hauliers, those trucks that pull up in Tesco and Aldi at night time and, and offload those groceries you need. The primary food producers or farmers. I hope farmers will be uh, really valued far more, I suppose, when we come out of this process. Um, our, our frontline, you know, it's not just the frontline people at the moment. There's so many people. Um, they're doing really difficult work. Uh, they have, like me, they've, they've kids maybe locked to the other side of a door or put out to the garden. Um, but, but look, people have had to modify how they live. Uh, and I think I said yesterday on Twitter, I would rather see thousands of people metaphorically 
die of boredom than to see a few dozen people die of respiratory failure. So I think it's important that, you know, someone in on BBC the other evening said, this is like the Blitz when bombs were raining in London and, you know, people hiding in shelters at night. It's nothing like that. Most people in Ireland, myself included, we've been asked to stay at home. We're, you know, in fairly comfortable surroundings. We're, we've adapted how we work. And by night time when dinner's cooked, we can sit down and watch Netflix. Our way of, of playing our parts in the emergency is actually to stay at home. Uh, so, you know, it does get tedious after a while, but um, look, dying of boredom isn't uh, the worst thing. It, the main thing is here that the people of Clare, all 120,000 of them, come out of this in the best possible shape insofar as their health is concerned. And right now, I think we're playing a pretty good part. Uh, our beaches seem to be being pretty empty the last few weekends. Uh, same with our forest parks in Cracklow, etc. So, look, what needs to be done is being done. There's another few weeks probably of that, you know, pain, but it's pain with a, a lower case P. Uh, and I think it'll all be worthwhile. We haven't had this spike that people have been talking about. We may not get a spike of COVID-19. It may just continue to be this kind of a, a mid-level plateau. Uh, but regardless, I think what the people of Clare are doing right now is, is paying dividends. And um, I don't mind working from home. I, I, eventually, I do want to uh, be up in the doll getting my teeth into it. But for now, look, these are small sacrifices in, in the public interest that we all have good good health, I think, coming out your side. That's perfect, Kyle. Thanks very much. We'll let you unlock the door and bring the kids <laughs> in from the garden. Thanks very much for joining. Thanks, buddy. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye.